musicians, uh, they're kind of born, uh, you know, if you have that love and that passion for it, then, then, then it's easy. No, it's not easy. It's never easy. But it's not work, hmm. as we consider work. Um, we have a strange idea about work in the West, that, we that work is something to be done and then at five o'clock forgotten all about because we're, we're going to now live. And, um, and a musician, true musician, doesn't feel like that. Uh, a musician doesn't have weekends or, or days off. Another day is the day of self-discovery and of discovery in the music. Mm. And it's marvelous. Just let me go back very briefly because you, you really need to understand what I was exposed to as a young teenager. Um, directly the time the guitar came into my hands. Um, having spent the, uh, all my life to that point listening and playing classical music, Western classical music, um, my brother, all elder brothers, um, got with two of them going to university and brought into home what was known as the blues boom in 19, began in 1952 uh, in the UK. Um, and uh, so by 1953, when I was 11 years old, uh, they came home with these fantastic blues records. And at the same time as I had the guitar, so immediately there's this, there's this connection between this instrument, even though I've grown up classical music, and I'm listening to these Mississippi blues players, and it was a revelation to me. It was absolutely phenomenal. Mm. It just blew my mind. And, uh, and, and, and I adored this music from, from the very first, very first moment. Um, and then, but thanks to my other brothers, uh, in, within the next five years, uh, I was exposed systematically to Indian music, which marked me also mm. forever. Mm. Um, flamenco music, <clears throat> very powerfully, to the point where I would skip school at uh, the end of every month and hitchhike down to Manchester. I was living in a small town <laughs> north in <laughs> England. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I had a brother at, at Manchester University, and I would hitchhike down to, 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 to his stay with him overnight because there was a, he would sneak me into a pub illegally, of course, underage, but there were, there was a real flamenco player called Pepe Martinez. And, uh, and so I was exposed to live flamenco music. And, and actually I wanted to be a flamenco guitar player, mm -hmm. but in the little town where I lived was, I mean, they'd never even heard of flamenco. <laughs> he didn't know what flamenco was. Uh, and then, uh, very shortly after that, within a year after, after trying to learn flamenco from recordings, you know, it was very difficult, you needed a teacher in flamenco, uh, I heard Miles Davis, and really that was the end mm. of my um, uh, search for a particular discipline. It continues to influence my style yeah. today, because it's part of my life. Mm. India is part of my, very important, part of my life, mm. interior and exterior. I mean, exterior means in my art. I mean, I wouldn't be who I am without India and without the impact of the Indian culture on my life. Um, the philosophy, the music, everything. But then I wouldn't be who I am without the impact of, of the Hispanic influence. Mm. But already the Hispanic influence, <clears throat> uh, I could hear because you listen to the early 20th century classical composers, particularly in the Impressionist school, and they adored the Hispanic influence. People like Ravel and Debussy. Um, the, the, you listen to these early Impressionist, 12, the, the, the French school, basically, of the early 20th century, and you'll hear that, you'll hear that, 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 that was part of them. Listen to, listen to, there's a recording Miles made in 1958 called Miles Ahead with Gil Evans Big Band. On that, this was one of the, 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 the pieces that, that just blew me away. Uh, it, it's called Blues for Pablo. And 
in it Miles shows and expresses his profound affection for Hispanic traditions because not only is he playing the blues that he always did Miles never left the blues uh, with, even with his phenomenal techniques you hear how much he adored the Hispanic influence and this element of flamenco and since I'd already be, uh, become under the spell of flamenco for me to hear Miles with this flamenco influence just consolidated everything that I felt about my direction you know it was it was it was perfect uh, the, the Maha Vishnu Orchestra this was uh, this was a number of influences coming together but I have to say that that <clears throat> You know, we have to look at the, at the two years prior to the creation of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Because I arrived in New York um, in early January 69 to play with Tony Williams, as I explained, and Khalid Yassin, Larry Young, the organ player. And it just so happened that I, got, I started working with Miles and recording with Miles at the same time. So I was doing two jobs in a way. Whenever I wasn't playing with Tony, I was playing with Miles, and I was recording with Miles, and of course I was recording with Tony. And I had two different, um, two different jobs in a way. With, with Lifetime, with Tony, Tony, he really liked the music that I wrote, and so he constantly encouraged me to write music. And so I would say that a great deal of pre-work of Mahavishnu music was done in the years 69-70 with Tony Williams and Lifetime. And don't forget there was the year 1970, Jack Bruce joined us, who mm. was my old comrade from, from Ginger Baker days mm. and uh, Graham Bond days. Um, and uh, the violin, the, viol the, the counter instrument to the guitar, I wanted a violin. Is because my mother played violin, probably, but I didn't want a jazz player. I wanted I wanted an R and B violinist, and uh, which might sound strange, but I felt that's where my instincts led me. And then eventually, I found Jerry Goodman playing in a band outside of Chicago called The Flock, that was you know I mean pretty unknown. But I heard him play, and, and I said, this guy is this guy is definitely for the band. And, uh, and, um, and Billy, uh, Billy Cobham, I met on the Jack Johnson recordings with Miles, which was a marvelous experience, uh, a p very particular, uh, with Miles especially. In any event, after that, that recording, Billy and I became very dear friends. Don't forget, by this time, um, by 19... 19 must have been 1971 around no, 1970 around this time October November 1970 um, I was already on the influence of Indian music I was studying Indian music and it, it was having an impact on me especially with its rhythms and its compound rhythmical cycles and I was I was finishing a, a, a concert in near Boston with Miles, and every all the musicians had gone home except Miles and myself, and we were just in the band room just chatting, and out of the blue he turns around and he said, "It's time you formed your own band." And I said, "What? What is he saying? You know?" Because, uh, but I took it very seriously because he was the most honest man I had ever met. Mm. He was brutal. Well, you know this 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 little anecdote that I told you about his being honest with me about not playing, not being up to standard, just because he was he was brutally honest with himself. He was brutally honest with everybody, but you always knew where you were with Miles. It was great. It's wonderful to have this kind of honesty, and and so I I, I couldn't really figure it out, but but I took him very seriously, and as if, if he says it, that means I have to do it. Mm. And so, and by this time I'd known Billy, um, and just so happened at this very time, 
I'd known Miroslav Vitus for a number of years mm. from, uh, you will remember Miroslav Vitus, the great bass player, and he called me up one day, this is about two months after Miles had given me this order, put your own band together. And, and Miroslav, whom I'd been friends with for years, he was a very dear friend, he said, um, listen, John, we're putting a band together with Wayne and Joe Zawinul. It's going to be called Weather Report, and we want you to be in it. And I said, I would love to be in it, but I've got to do my own thing. Miles has told me to do, to put my band together. So I have to do it. And thank you, I would love to do it, but I have to do this. Because he's, he's got faith in me, so I, I've got to justify that faith. So he said, well, that's great, okay. Uh, well, listen, if you need a piano player, he said, uh, because he's Czech from Prague, he said, if you need a piano player, he said, uh, you heard it, you know, you don't know Jan Hammer, but he's, he's out on, in California playing piano with Sarah Vaughan. He's really good. I said, well, if he's playing with Sarah Vaughan, he's really good. And so I, he gave me his number and I called him, and, and he was ready. He was ready to move out of that classic jazz into new music. Wow. And really, that, that's how the band came about. Mm -hmm. And of course, by this time, I'd written a lot of music because of the two years I'd been with Tony. And Miles, I said there were two different kind of jobs. Miles, all he wanted were things from my R&B days. You know, like what kind of, he play a chord. What do you hear? Peter Jess, um, you're sitting on, on a sidewalk cafe, enjoying your breakfast, and there's a little dog coming over to your table and it sits down and he won't move and it starts to sing. What would you do? Listen. Of course. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a singing dog. Well, of course I'm going to listen. Wow, man. Sing. You have also jammed and record recorded with Jimi Hendrix. Mm. And I, uh, I wonder what is the greatest memory you have from, from that, that period, flying south? Well, I think, no, first of all, Jimmy was, he was just a beautiful, lovely, sweet person and absolutely unpretentious, which is actually my experience with all the great players, Miles too. Very simple, no pretension. It's just, it's the mediocre players who kind of like, you know, moody and silly. Uh, and, and Jimmy was that. He was just, he was delightful. Just a so nice person. Um, but uh, I would put Jimmy on a very high position. Now, it's clear that he was not the musician of John Coltrane's level, for example. But on another aspect of music, they had a great deal in common mm. um, that, that certainly influenced me and millions of other players because what Jimmy did to the guitar was revolutionary. Uh, I think he had, he, he was held by Eric Clapton. I think Eric did, did fantastic work in the 60s uh, with, um, with John Mayall and the Blues Breakers and subsequently with my old pals Jack and Ginger with Cream. Um, and Jimmy, I think that had an impact on him, but then he took it to a different level. And I, I really adore Jimmy. I think he did marvelous things. He had such an impact on me. Because by the already long before, actually, years before, uh, I heard either Eric or, or, or Jimmy, um, I, I didn't like this cool jazz guitar sound. For me, it was too too cool. It was so cool, it was a bit cold. It, 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 it missed mm -hmm. the thing. And, and I've been listening to Coltrane and Miles, and of course, the, 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 the sheer passion of those players. Um, and Coltrane, particularly when, when in 1964, 65, when he brought out Love Supreme, and, he, and he's starting to play more than one blow, more than one note on the saxophone some of his notes, you can hear a chord almost. It's like distorted. And Jimmy took this distortion in a fantastic way, mm. marvelous way. Mm. And, uh, and so he had 
I mean, I don't think uh, I wouldn't be who I am, how I play without Jimmy, but I wouldn't be who I am without BB King either. Very good. So it's John's dedicated juice, and in this case, I called it the delicate dimension fusion. Fusion. <laughs> mm. I walked in after a gig. At the, at the village vanguard with with Mitch who'd come to see us and I mean I walked in the studio and it was like hallucinating loud <laughs> you know and I had the, I was playing this Gibson hummingbird Do you know what a hummingbird is it's a round hole mm -hmm. with the I plugged it in I mean and my guitar just freaked out almost exploded